So joining us is Shokwe Aluko. Shokwe Aluko. Uh, yes. <laughs> now the full name, the full name will be... Ibi Shokwe. I am the only Ibi Shokwe, I have to tell you. So there might be other Shokwe's out there. Love to you all, but I am the only Ibi Shokwe. But there must be other names. There, there must be... Uh, yes, I... So yours would be Ibi Shokwe. Ibi Ibi Shokwe Ibi Shokwe Ibi Ibi Shokwe 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 Ibi no, it's not. Oh my gosh, I've forgotten what my Oriki is. And I should, I should, I remember. Oh I my God. God. I'm going to have to ask my sister. Oh my goodness, this is, this is just gone out of my head right now. This is, this is uh, 50. Uh, this is 50. I'm, I'm, I'm fi forgetting stuff. Um, but no, yeah, I do you're have not, You're not 50. You look all, all, of, all of 38. So, so we're not going to take that from you. Oh but my gosh. You are, you are a star of, uh, of uh, a Perfect Pitch, Bloodline, Graceland how to get away with murder and of course thank the big you know. one is black panther uh and so thank you so much for speaking to us i know it's been quite a a, a, a rough ride recently for you and your colleagues uh with yeah. the, the passing of chadwick boseman so thanks for making time but let, let's let's skip back to what i might call the beginnings mm. you are the son uh, the daughter of an ambassador uh, you have lived in Kenya. You have lived in is it Singapore or Indonesia? Indonesia. You have lived in Trinidad and Tobago. You, I mean, you've been all over the place. Uh, what are your earliest memories of traveling with your parents? And when you close your eyes and think of it, what are the pictures you see and what are the emotions you feel? Oh, wow. Yeah, um, earliest memories, I would say, would be Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and just everywhere, really. I mean, in Kenya. And, and, I, and, I, pick, and I close my eyes and I think of my happy place. Um, because actually, you know, as you know, my parents are both deceased. Um, and those were good times. We, we lived amongst the culture then. For instance, my father... Um, when we were in Kenya, he worked very closely with Nelson Mandela and most of the uh, people in the African movement. So, you know, he was an activist. Um, he was so much more than I, I can even say. He spoke eight languages. He was always about being for the people, knowing the people, part of the culture. Um, wherever we lived, it was not about, oh, here and them and us. It was all about Let's understand them. My father always said something. Um, and he said, always try your best to know at least some, th some word in somebody's language because it breaks barriers. Wow. And it really does. He said, if you could just say hello. You know, so that's why I, I, my, my love for languages started. Karimakasi in Indonesian, you know, rather than just, you know, flying in and flying out, but really eat their food, laugh with them. Even if we're, you know, I'm a Christian and they're Muslims find a common bond and uh and i've always found that i've used that in all my life in all my travels even now that whenever i go to a country and i i say a word in their language they smile it mm -hmm. disarms people all of a sudden doesn't it you know now, when you when you look at you in your experience both growing up and now as, as an adult um you've had the opportunity to be in spaces with uh, other people like your father, heads of states and, and ambassadors and the likes. How unusual was that trait your father had of, of uh, fighting for the people and, and getting the boots with the people? And, because I can imagine uh, as, a, as a diplomat, uh, doing that sometimes might have been really dangerous for him in terms of his career, because yeah. you're supposed to be the middleman that's neither here nor there you're just you know but he's going going straight for the, how unusual was that in you in your experience when you look at it you know you know it's so funny as you say that question i, I find that i have so many traits of my father because my father was never um a gray man he was black or white and by that i say that he always focused on the truth 
I remember very young when, um, as, you, as you know, we had the whole Metasini situation in Nigeria. And my father was one of the, in charge and said, no, we're going to fight. We're going to make sure. He was always a diplomat, always the middleman. Those who are not familiar with that situation, explain what that, that situation was. Well, it was really kind of like a, 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 pretty much what we're dealing with today. It's the Muslim North um, versus the South, you know. And um, things could have escalated incredibly at that time to another tribal war. Mm -hmm. And my father led the charge to diplomatically speak to both sides so that they didn't have that. And I remember very quickly when I was, I think I was about six, being rushed from school and were taken to Kano at an undisclosed place with armed guards and things like that. Now, we thought it was a holiday, myself and my younger sister. We did not know that our lives weren't threatened. Mm. Fast forward to play times when we're in, um, in Africa, in Kenya, when my father would be having meetings, uh, you know, in our basement and having Indians, because there was a time when, you know, um, um, Idi Amin wanted the Indians to, out of the country. My father kept most of them in our basement and we were singing, Aunt Sigi, yes. I mean, we had a lot of that, who have became firm friends of ours, you know, and, and I just think about how brave he was. Um, and I know that braveness, when I, when I read my Bible, came from God. It really did, because he never knew how it was going to end. He always had times, cornerstones in his life, where he was forced to take a road. And whenever he took that road, it was a road that was hard. Yeah. And, um, you know, all of us as a family were involved and included. And he told us about what was happening you know, and we understood it, but we always felt that he was right because we were a praying family and we prayed together and we asked for God's grace and, and strength going through it. But, um, so to, so tell, us, tell us a bit about the, um, the, the, the journey of faith in the, in the family, uh, for the family and tell us at what stage did that faith become a personal thing for you? Because, um, like I mentioned before we started watching you on, on Songs of Praise and then watching your interviews, whether you're doing it for Disney, whether you're on the red carpet for your event, you always talk about God. So clearly this God thing is a personal thing for you. So the, 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 the faith, the journey of faith for the family, describe that for us. And when did it become a personal uh, experience for you, Shokwe? Well, I grew up in a family, a praying family, like I said. My mother was the chief prayer, and we woke up every morning at four o'clock in the morning. Yes, uh, four a.m. Oh my goodness! Oh my, you know, and you know, we'd be praying, and we'd have two-hour-long prayers every single day. Of course, you know, we were not happy. I didn't understand it. Then I went to boarding school, and I was confirmed. And I know I kind of gave my life to Christ, but you don't really understand it. You know, you're just kind of like hopping along. I think I, um, I really did not, um, I really started standing on my own prayers and my own faith when I um, was born again and when I got married to my husband. And um, I, I, I felt at that point, God was like, okay, you need to be stronger in your faith. Enough of being covered by the prayers of your mother and your father. Um, you need to start standing on your own. So there were a series of things that happened in my life that, you know, um, was stretching me, stretching me. And even until today, to be honest with you, I'm continuously stretched. Um, so that moment when you say you were born again, what, what happened? I mean, for me, I was sitting in a, in a, honestly, I was sitting in a church. I was the misfit amongst the kids. Uh, and and my, my feet stunk. Even I knew <laughs> it stunk. And the preacher was preaching. I was sweating, thing, feeling so bad about how bad my feet. So I thought everyone could smell my feet. And he makes the altar call. And I thought, oh, God, Jesus, I really want to know you. So I, I wish I could say it was one of those Paul of Damascus moments, but it was not. But what was it like for you? For me, it was, um, I, I sat in my, a church in Miami. And... Um, being totally honest, I've struggled with depression all my life. Um, and I never knew that I had depression. I just knew that I had swinging lows and debilitating lows. And I just, at that moment, when I sat in that church, um, 20 something, and I said, God, I don't understand me. What is my purpose in this world? 
I don't know. I just feel that I need to have a purpose. And I just felt this urge to just go to the altar. I'm a shy person normally. And I was baptized, full baptism, put myself in the water. And from that day on, um, stuff started happening to me. And it was, it was, I wouldn't say it was just challenges. I felt attacks, constant attacks, constant attacks. They were, they were not as much to the point that, you know, when I'm sitting alone with God in my prayer cousin, I'm said, should I have really done that then? Because I mean, I can't take this one now, you know, yet another thing. And it was just, it, my, my, my father died soon after, then my mother, then I just had crushing blows of disappointment, lost my job, this and that, and all kinds of things. And it, it just, became very clear to me that the only person I could hang on to was him. Right. It was just him um, in my loneliness, in my, in my closet, my prayer closet, as I call it, my prayer knees. I mean, they're bleeding all the time because I'm always on my knees. And, um, and it just, it became that all I had was him. And that's why, you know, every time people say, how were you able to switch careers and then do this and do that? I said, I, I can't give any glory, but to God, because I don't even know. It's like, it's like, it's, I mean, like you would think it was just something that's unexplainable. It really is. You, 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 you talked in passing there about changing careers. You're, you're actually, uh, uh, you have a master's in marketing and also is it engineering? You're, yeah, I did you're, engineering. Yes. So you're, you're an engineer who has a master's <laughs> in marketing, yeah. but here you are a Hollywood actress. Uh, and I'm going to ask you about that later on. But uh, going back briefly to the faith of the family, one of the things I've heard you say in some of your interviews uh, is talking about how you learnt uh, uh, the scriptures. It was important in your family to learn scriptures and also to learn your own language. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes you said you'd go once once having traveled with a mission uh, with the with your father, getting back home, uh, you and your sibling spoke better Yoruba than the people yeah. in Lagos but uh, which is some <laughs> tickles me but now uh, the, the bible part of it how have the scriptures uh, both then and now how did they guide your your decisions as per your your career and influence in your life well um Wow, you've lot worked. You've watched a lot of my interviews. I can't even remember sometimes what I've said in them, but um, you know, he always says that you need to know his word in order to know God. You need to know his word, and um, I'm constantly searching. Different uh, scriptures mean different things at different points of my life. Hmm. Scriptures were the things that my mother spoke to us and my father spoke to us as the um, metaphors for life. Um, so that's all I've ever known. That's all the, the book I've always known was the word. And therefore, um, I did not know at that time that I would need the scriptures in the future. Right. So um, sometimes when I am thinking that I'm not remembering these scriptures verbatim, they come into my mind. And I know that that's the Holy Spirit equipping me for what's to come. And um, my father was very... Um, he did not want us to forget our culture. He kept on saying, as much as we traveled around the world, he says, I don't want you to be spoiled brat kids. Mm -hmm. Certainly we were not. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to know your culture, know your language and be able to pray in your language. And he was very um, adamant about that. And, and the reason why we would laugh is that we would go home and we speak to our cousins and we're like, do you guys know how to say Psalms 23 in, in Yoruba? And they were like, no. Like, how come they get away with it? <laughs> have to you know they don't have to and we would go back to our dad and he goes he goes are they my children no <laughs> and so that was it and that's how and then i find that i'm praying in my scripture i'm praying in uh, yoruba sometimes i'm praying in those things and i thank god oh. because he knew then what i would need now so when, this, when you when you think uh your thoughts are they in english or in yoruba or both they're in english they're very much in English first, but they're also some Yoruba that's, um, that I can't even explain the translation that my mom and dad would tell me, um, 
that, oh, this is what, you know, whatever it is. For instance, when I'm praying against just a protection of my family, I have a certain scripture that I pray in Yoruba because it sounds better. It feels yeah. better, you know? And isn't, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it a different experience when you pray in Yoruba or sing in Yoruba? It just, yes. it just has this resonance that you can't, English just does not do it. It doesn't get, it doesn't do it. And, and especially my praise and worship, which is my favorite, 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 Mm -hmm. um, I love to worship in Yoruba and they're just some songs that just like, oh, they hit you and you're just like, oh God, you feel me? I don't even, I can even sing the tune while I'm doing the dishes and I know that I feel in the presence of the Lord. Right. So you're absolutely right. Niger Yoruba is my first, it's my DNA. It's woven into me, um, even though I've kind of like lived in England and etc. So, so we said, as is you, you confirmed that you trained as an engineer. Um, marketing was a big part in, in your masters um though you had this passion uh, as a thespian but being us being nigerian i mean i i have a music degree but my my mother who herself was a radio broadcaster was like go and do a business degree you know <laughs> just get a, a proper job uh, yeah. but so you did the journey of education you're in the corporate world, you're working, it's, it's steady, it's, you're not having to do red eye, uh, do California, where you don't know whether if you read, when you read the line, whether they'll say yes or no, you do your job, you get your, get well played, yet you decide to walk away from it. How did you find the courage to walk away from a stable uh, career into acting? And how much did your faith influence that decision? Oh, gosh. I, I always tell people, I said, I went from first class to um, cargo, literally. <laughs> and, and I don't even know how it happened. It, literally, that was my life. I mean, I've written, I've written it and I've actually, it's, I'm actually working and getting it scripted into TV, uh, TV series. But um, the faith, um, I've always wanted to be an actor ever since I was young. From, you know, I know, I know a lot of people say that, but that's what I always wanted to be. When I went to boarding school, I joined all the creative arts. I did all the training, ballet, everything. And then I honestly thought I was going to be an actor. And then, you know, my parents were very um, open-minded in that and, and formal. Like my father and mother would say, you know, sit down with us and, and have a presentation set, what your ideas are for the world and blah, 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 and where you're going to move. And, and so I did. I had my presentation set and I sat down in front of my parents. I said, mommy, daddy, I've already told you these are all the subjects I love, blah, blah, blah. I want to be an actor. And they literally looked at each other and said, is that what we took you tonight? <laughs> <laughs> are you smoking? I mean, <laughs> I talk, all, you know, I knew you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, they just like literally laughed in my face. Oh, wow. And I was so heartbroken. I honestly thought that they knew that that, they knew, they knew that that's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, we are, we're making sure that you, you find a profession that will protect you, that will give you, you know, you will flourish. We have four girls. We want to make sure everybody can stand alone um, when we're gone, et cetera, et cetera. And I got it. I got it. They were doing it out of love. Mm -hmm. um, but when I did my master's and uh, I finished and I did all that, and then my dad died first, who was my um, rock, my, my compass, my true love. I, I, we talk about dad, daddy's girls, and I, I was one, um, along with all my sisters. Uh, that threw me for a loop. And then my mom was diagnosed immediately after and died. And I just thought, all right, God, I've done everything I was meant to do. I've done the and degrees. I've done the marriage. I've had the children. I want just my thing now. And I remember very clearly when I was um, at a movies, um, when my mother was, we knew she was passing on. And um, we all decided to go, go to the movie theater at midnight in Atlanta to cheer ourselves up. And what did we watch? We watched Doubt. Oh. I don't know if this, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Look, that's not a cheer up movie okay no, um, is it? first and foremost so we're sitting there in the theater and I look up and I see Viola Davis and this is long before she became the star that she was so hold on hold on hold on this is long before this is miles before 
How to Get Away with Murder, where yes. you work with yes. Anna Davis. I saw her on the screen and I heard a whisper saying, it's your time. I literally heard it when I saw her on the screen. I said, oh, Lord, she's dark like me. She, she's doing great. I'm spellbound. She was on screen all but 13 minutes. And that just shook me. And I just heard that whisper and said, it's time. It's let, time. Let, me, okay. let, let me ask, so, sorry to interrupt. For someone who has a dream um, like you did, it may not be acting. It may be a, a whole different line, uh, but they, they, they're so, they feel like I'm so far gone on this trail uh, to start this. Uh, I'll be starting afresh. Uh, how, how old were you or how far were you in terms of, uh, I mean, for they say actors, you, you should start early. Uh, how old were you? Uh, I was so, 40. I was 40. I was like, like so in your 40, middle age. It was 40, 40 and I was... Um, from scratch. Yes, start from scratch. Forget everything. I did not know what was to come. I knew there was a confirmation there that what I was wanting to do, I wanted to do it. So I remember talking to my mom and her dying bed and I said, mommy, I want to do this. Please, when you get up to heaven, please tell God, this is what I want to do, et cetera, et cetera. And then hearing that voice and, and, and just confirmed it to me, I did not know the journey ahead of me. I did not know that I would have to start from scratch. I would have to be so humble. That's why I said it's from first class to cargo, literally. Um, I blew through my savings. I was laughed at from my family, my sisters, my husband. Everybody was just like, what? Have you gone mad? They first thought it was grief. But so they gave me some time to just grieve. And then it became a, a year, two years, three years. She's still at it. Four years. My entire um, community of corporate culture, I never told them. I didn't tell anybody in my lifestyle, in my, anything. Uh, it got to a point where my marriage was um, in question, where I was given an ultimatum. Um, um, and, and every time I would go back to my prayer closet and go on my knees and said, Lord, if this is not of you, remove it. Because it's creating so much stress in my life and my kids and my kids are coming up to me and telling me, mommy, you and daddy are fighting. Just stop this thing. Literally. I mean, I'm being completely honest about it. It was bad. And, and yet I would, Whenever something would come like that, I would book a little roll. I'd be like, really, God? Is that, that didn't really answer the question, but it was his way of like, my, just keep going. And it was just, it's always been like that. My journey, um, my journey with God has always been a faith journey. Even now, even now after booking Black Panther um, and my for husband. Someone, for someone watching, um, and I know that um, for you, I mean, watching, trying to prep for you and watching the interviews, I know that the, the Black, Black Panther moment was, was uh, uh, a moment that, that I, I suppose the, the circle was completed for you and your husband where you looked at each other and, and say, this, this is it. This was my dream. He, he <laughs> cried. We were crying. We were crying at the premiere. And even just getting to the premiere was a something because getting the role was something because I put it on my vision board, my, bo my God vision board. And I said, God, I want something that will make me proud of me being a Nigerian and make, you know, um, be a blockbuster that everybody would see Africa in such a beautiful way that it is. I did it all. I said it all. And so when Black Panther came out, I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is it. This is the one. And I auditioned for five roles. So for one after another. For someone who's still in the place that you were, where they've they've stepped out and what they believe is faith, uh, their heart's desire, but they're in a place where they've been laughed at and and those who support them. And and you know, you you, you can understand for, for, for some people because they're looking at the reality of it and saying, you know, why are you doing this? And but someone who's going through that right now for whatever, whether it's, whatever it's music, whether it's, I mean, whether it's a normal job or even a relationship and they're, they're in a place where they, they, be, they begin to ask themselves the question, God, is this really you? Like you may have asked, what are some of the things looking back, uh, if you were talking to yourself, then you would have said to you that you can say to them. Always take it back to God. Always take it back to him. 
if it's meant to be, he'll find a way for you. I know there's so many times that you feel that he's not answering your prayer. But like I said, every time I would go back to him on my knees and say, God, if this is not of you, then remove it. There will be a sign. Listen, be attuned to the signs. Um, when he always says, be still, I am God. Be still. Mm. Don't, don't, don't be of this world. It's almost like he's shepherding you through. You know, there's one thing I say, you know, they're dream killers they are dream killers and sometimes you've got to protect your dream and i have to say back then my dream killer was my family they you know and and you have that's why i said go back to him he's where the you, only source where did you find the uh the, the strength or the clarity of mind uh for that not to turn into bitterness um because for some people uh, it becomes a siege yeah. They'll think, uh, you know, they're my enemies, so they are against me. But for you, uh, it seemed you still embraced them as family, even though you didn't share the same view as them. Uh, and, and for you, it must have been painful. Where did you find that extra to not be bitter and mm. go down that route? Well, I mean, I would read the Bible. And I remember reading once when um, Jesus went, to the disciples and they were fishing and they, they didn't have any, they hadn't caught anything. I remember very clearly the pastor was saying at church, he goes, it, basically the way I, I kind of like um, remember that scripture was still go about your business. Don't let up. So I still went about being the best wife I could be, the best mother I could be, the best sister I could be, the best everything I could be, while my dream was still being massaged through. I, I had to, as much as you said that bitterness, it's very, it, it's, it, you could, it, you could get to that tipping point of like, I don't give a crap. I, no, but while you're waiting on God, continue to do what you are meant to do. So I was still a mother to my children. I'd still take them to school. I was still part of the PTA and doing everything. I mean, I was, I was tired. I was doing multiple things, but I still had to, um, show God's glory in those areas of my life. So I couldn't the, afford not to. The word of God and the Bible uh, and prayer were key parts of, of that in taking it back to God. Absolutely. Spend okay. time with God always. It is so important in this world, particularly of social media and all kinds of things. It's just sitting with him. And sometimes I would just sit there for hours um, waiting on an answer. So... Um, you know, I, I wish we had six hours to just get all we can from you, uh, your experiences, the wisdom, but I, I've got such a short window and, and let's go to uh, the set of Black Panther. You've spoken about it in different interviews about how it felt like church at times. Um, people were sharing testimonies and and uh, uh, you yourself, you would, you would hear people's testimony, you feel the presence of God. I wonder if you could, uh, uh, for, for someone who all they've seen is, is uh, the screen, Black Panthers on screen, can you paint for us a picture as, as, as much as you can of the, the presence of faith or the Christian faith or, or, or the expressions of it? onset of Black Panther. What was it like? Were you, were you guys just breaking out into song? Uh, was Angela Bassett pulling out the Bible and reading? Tell, tell us a bit about that. There were just uh, inexplicable situations that you knew the Holy Spirit was there. So they would, you know, the, they have to turn around the camera, like for instance, the Warriors, Warriors Foil scenes. And so we'd all be waiting around until they kind of turned around the cameras or whatever it was. And the next minute you hear the drums going, and everything was just like moving. And there was a swaying that won't, you know. And they were like, and then all of a sudden people were just singing. And, it, and, and it, that, that was inexplicable. You know, Forrest and I would look at each other and go, wow, <laughs> stuff is happening here. You say Forrest, but, Forrest Whitaker. That's right. I mean, um, these, these are first name friends for you. I mean, these are people, I mean. I, I would say to my friends, I would say to my friends, I, I would say that, let me tell you something, and that set, there were no egos. Mm. It was egoless. And 
I guess maybe it was Ryan being the, the humble soul that he was. Ryan, um, the director. Ryan, Ryan, the director that greeted everybody equally um, uh, to Chadwick. Mm -hmm. uh, God, Chadwick was just phenomenal. Um, try not to get emotional, but Chadwick mm -hmm. to the producers, Nate, to the stars, the, uh, uh, Angela Bassett and seeing her children and Forrest and talking to him. And there was nothing there that said, these are big stars you're acting with, you know, know your place. Nothing. There was just a feeling of, there was something that we're working on that was greater than us. Right. And that we needed to deliver on that promise. Um, and everybody, we didn't speak it to each other, but we, we were just walking in it. Even if it was long days, a long night, we didn't care. It was like, this thing's gonna be big. It, we all sensed it was gonna be big. We just knew it. So were, were, there, were, there, were there moments where some of you might uh, uh, have a quick prayer or, or things like that? And what, what was some of the, did you see, did you say, okay, we, quick prayer about this and then see the results of it later on on set or was yes. it yes Shit. i was i remember i kept on praying romans 15 3 and saying god going ahead of me etc and then um you know the song we've got a miracle working god we've got oh, a miracle yeah. work let me tell you something i'm getting on my trailer and this african-american woman is singing we've got a miracle working Wow. She was one of the costume people. I said to her, I said, uh, 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 where, where'd you get that from? Oh, I have some Nigerians at my church. And that I was asking God to, to make his presence known to me. I said, I want to know that you are there. And he just, that was it. And the next minute, Letitia Wright was coming past and she was talking to somebody, ministering to somebody. I mean, it was just, it was just God. I mean, there were just so many of that that was going on, really. Um, you know, there was a lady, Miss Dorothy, he's, who's in her 90s. And this was her first acting gig. And she talked about it and we laughed about it. And it, it was just family. It was family. And there's some things that we are going to leave there and we can't share, but we know that we know that we know he was there. Um, wow. Yeah. And, and, and evidently, it, I mean, there's so many of you um, there who, who carried him, carried the Holy Spirit with you. Uh, but let's talk about about briefly about uh, Chadwick Boseman. His his passing away was a shock to to everyone, um, and and the outpouring of my my, my nephew, who's also my godson, uh, Joshua is uh, Joshua is four, fourteen, and uh, my sister was just telling me on Sunday that when uh, she was just she was in her room and and she heard joshua screaming no no banging and she went into his room and said what happened and he said he's gone and she says who's gone and she said he said to uh, chadwick boseman she was who she, she's old she said the guy that played black panther and at that point, and my sister's very Nigerian, you know, mm. uh, her natural reaction would have been, ah, yes, gather yourself. She said at that point, she stepped back from the room and said, Joshua, I'm so sorry. Now, here's a kid who all he'd known of Chadwick was him in that role. Uh, Tell us a bit about your experience of him and his impact on all of you in, on, on the set of Black Panther. Oh, well, um, I, I, I don't want to say that Chadwick was um, any kind of God of any kind, but I know God was working through him and he had a servant attitude. He really did. He was, everybody, every one of us has a story about him. I did not know what everybody else's story was, but my story with him was I used to call him my African brother. And he would say, my sister, you know, because Chadwick spoke in the, in the African dialect all the time, 
even when we weren't working. He just spoke in that all the time. He's, you know, he's a method actor and everything. And I remember the first time I met him when I first came on set and we were talking and, um, and he was saying about how he was up early in the morning to deal with his, with, to, to, to coach his, with his dialect coach in England. Um, and, and, and all that stuff. And we were talking to myself, Forrest and him were talking about it. And then he said, and then I'm on the phone with my lady, which obviously was his, with it was his, uh, wife now and um soon after that i was kind of like moving away and, and chattery kind of like hey you know um and he we just started talking and 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 when we were talking every day we would talk and i would get a hug from him and a smile from him and i would tell him i said are you sure you're not from nigeria because you look very much like my cousin he says my sister i'm not now eh i think what i mean i know the place and we would go like that and right. then there was even a time when i said can, can, can I introduce you to my sister? Because you are really good. Yes. And he says, what does she look like? I mean, this is how we were, you know, joking. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then, and then I told him, I said, uh, but I heard you had a lady friend. He goes, I do. I'm just joking. I, and, yeah, and we were just, he was like that. Mm. He was like the warmest, kindest, most humble, sweet. He was everything. There was nothing about um, any kind of ego on him. And one thing I noticed when we were in the Warriors Falls, we were doing, we did that for about four weeks. And I don't know if you're aware, but because of, you know, the weather situation, one day would be at 30 degrees weather and the next day would be at 70 degrees. It was literally yo-yoing like that. So we'd have our coats on, but you would see that he had to go into the water and then he had to be, and we did that many times. And I, because myself and Forrest were always close to him, I would see him shaking like literally um, from, you know, whatever. And I, I would just think, oh my gosh, my immediate thing was like cover him. I just wanted to protect him. But he was going through. That's why I said the spirit was God was working through him because he did all his stunts himself. He was the hardest working, you know, first on set, never like, oh, we've got to count, um, wait for number one. You know, he's number one in the call shit. Nope, they're already on place. It, he was incredible mm. incredible um i noticed that he used to wear this tatty um 42 shirt or cap or muhammad muhammad ali um just and it wasn't like you know it was a fan gear it was just old stuff tatty and just in hindsight i almost think that he was just fighting knowing now that wow. he he was fighting those were his um metaphors for i'm a fighter you know um, I can't say enough good things about Chadwick. I really can't. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know, one would be sad to lose anybody, but he was, he was Black Panther. And I, I, I just, we mourn him. He was a brother. When you talk to, to your sons um, in your unguarded moments, what do, you, what do you say to them about him? Ah, um, well, first of all, I heard the news on our 23rd anniversary my husband and I's 23rd anniversary, we went out for dinner and we hadn't been out. Um, and we got home and I got the text and I, I just cried and I continue to cry. I'm still getting emotional. Now we have his memorial coming up for the cast. Um, because, um, they know, I mean, when my son came to me, there were tears in his eyes and, and he, I, he just didn't, he goes, mom, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, my husband, he hears me crying during my sleep. It, it's, really, it's really affected me badly, and I don't know why. Maybe because we've lost some people through COVID, right. uh, family members back in Nigeria. And then just this loss again just did not seem fair um, at this time. So uh, it, it's, it's definitely a loss, not just for us as the Black Panther family, but I think it's for the world. Um, so he, let's, yeah. let's talk briefly about this um, COVID moment, we, we spoke about it before we started. Um, it's really unearthed quite a number of ugly things about us as human beings. Um, uh, it's unearthed things around racism, etc. You were saying, uh, what, what's been your experience and your family's experience um, because you were saying actually at one point you said to 
to your 17 year old son it's not good for us to go out together uh, what's been your personal experience in Miami of of this moment um, as pertain to COVID navigating racism and discrimination and, and all the ugliness that we've seen of us as human beings well um let's just say that before COVID even hit I, as a mother of two teenage boys, my charge in life, my family comes first. And as an actress, I was mostly in LA and I had to speak to my representation and tell them that I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be more in Miami than in LA. And it was, you know, during prime season, you know, pilot season, which I don't know if you know, is when, you know, they do pilot episodes and uh, for series to be picked up. So it's a real prime time for um, people uh, to want you there. And I, I wasn't, I had some family issues. Uh, I had my sister who was giving birth to twins at the age of 48 um, and was constantly in and out of uh, hospital. And so I had to be there for her. And I had my two boys who were experiencing life as black teenagers in America that was, that was slowly building into some form of ugly, ugliness. So when COVID now hit, um, it became very apparent to us as a family that we needed to really stick to each other closely. Um, we had a neighbor, our, one of our mail was delivered to our neighbor next door to us. And um, unfortunately, and, and you know, my husband's like, oh yeah, I'll send my son over. And my neighbor said to him, I don't think that's a good idea. You know? Um, and then, you know, when we're all going out exercising and things like that, um, and people are out there and, and their bikes and things like that. And I have to second guess and go, my son and I wanted to go for a walk. And my husband's like, mm, maybe, you, no, don't do that. Not yet. So we have to be cautious about what we do. Mm -hmm. We have to be prayerful, but faith without works, you know? Um, and like I said, the temperature is very high. We're at boiling point. Everybody is going through stuff, loss of job, loss of family and loved ones, loss, loss, loss. Everyone is grieving some form and they are manifesting that grief in different ways. And a lot of it is in anger. But, you know, you, pe people look at you, think, you know, you're a successful actress, you're a Hollywood actress. Um, and you're the daughter of of great uh, you got you come from great pedigree of uh, you're not you're not of the middle classes you're of the upper middle classes you're great African etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, what fears do you have for for yourself and your children? Surely, I mean, you you are you are buffered enough to not worry about things that normal people worry about. What are the fears that you have for your children and how has uh, the word of God, uh, how has your relationship with God uh, helped in that? Um, I fear for my children's lives. My wish is for them to, is to grow up and be married and have their own kids and have a wonderful life. And I leave this world when God deems it. Um, but when my 17 year old son who says to me, he has no desire to learn how to drive because what's the point? He'll get shot. You know, that, that's, uh, that's, that keeps me up at night, honestly. And um, my faith in God is the only thing that can carry me through, carry um, my, my family through. And like I said, when, when we started off this interview, we talked about my mother being the praying mother. I found that I've taken my mother's place. I'm constantly, I mean, family members say, ah, oh, man, yeah, become a ladra, kind of, always pray, pray. <laughs> I say, I don't, I don't know. I, I <laughs> I'm always praying. I'm praying for my sons. I'm praying and fasting and praying and asking God for, for his mercy and his grace on this earth. Um, so that, I will say that, they, that it does keep me up at night, but it makes sure that I'm also vigilant. Um, I don't know why I was here when COVID hit. I thank God that I was here when COVID hit and not in LA. I don't know why God felt prior to COVID hitting, I needed to be here. 
I was here um, and I had to protect my family first. For, for once, I had to put my career aside and protect my family. So the career that I fought so much for had to be put aside for this moment, for this time. And it's been, it's been a good two years and I haven't, I haven't booked any work. I'm being honest, I haven't booked any work. Um, but I know that God has a purpose and a plan for everything. And I have to keep on saying that his timing is his, is his timing. Um, I, 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 um, I want to wrap our conversation. Um, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It's you, you and Steve Harvey have done the same thing because I was supposed to talk, talk to you briefly. And here we are knocking on an hour's door same thing with steve harvey was supposed to talk for 15 minutes we talked for almost two hours but uh, that record we're not gonna try <laughs> um uh, so you you've just mentioned uh the impact of of covid on you personally uh but it's it's hit your industry uh, yes programs are not being made films are not being released etc um what uh, to to your knowledge in, in, in your circles, what are some of the stories of the impact of lockdown that you know of personally uh, on your industry? Because your industry is not just cameras, it's human beings. Um, yeah. What are some of the stories that you're, you're familiar with of the impact of uh, the lockdown and Corona on the, the industry? And, and how can we pray for that community uh, as far as you're concerned? Well, I think that the, the biggest hurdle right now, um, certainly from being a union actor, is making sure that we're tested um, and we're protected. So um, as a union actor, I fall under the union rules. And there's a 45-page old, um, 45 page, um, uh, safety rules for actors on set. So it's all about getting tested regularly, getting the results, and making sure that everybody is safe and well. Um, but that's so difficult in this industry because you touch so many people, you know, everybody from the PAs to food and safe, all kinds of things. So we as actors, um, I know the reason why I became an actor. Uh, and the reason was that I wanted to shed stories to people um, just like they were to me when I was younger that gave light and had a social conscious awareness that resonated with people and helped people and guided people or whatever it is. It, it, you know, God says he blesses us to bless others. I want to be a vessel, vessel of blessing. And not being able to do that right now is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, I'm blessed that I have a family to support me, but I know a lot of actors in this community um, are living paycheck to paycheck and you know, this is their only um, form of income. So I would ask prayers for the entire actors, community, TV, film, theaters, um, everybody that's in this business, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, makeup artists, everybody, that um, we will consciously find a way of protecting the work that we have, the stories that we have, um, and whatever it is that we're charged to do in a good way in, in, going forward um, and, and protect our lives. Uh, that Put that first before anything else, before monetary reasons or before blockbusters or meetings, certain be benchmarks in the theaters, et cetera. But putting that first, our safety and our health and our well-being, because this, this disease is serious. I've lost family members that I can't even, I haven't even grieved them properly yet, you know. Um, it's really, really, really serious. So that, that would be my prayer, um, particularly now that everybody's watching TV. That's what's getting them through the stories on, 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 the, on the shows that they're watching right now. So, you know, there's, there's very little that's in that, um, in, that, in that shoot of films that are coming forward. You know, we're looking at old episodes, in new, new episodes, whatever. Some have had to stop in between COVID, et cetera, et cetera. So just, just to make sure that the stories that need to come out that glorify God, they come out and there's no, there's no delay in them coming out and bless us that uh, while we, we're ensuring that we, um, we do God's work. 
you know, there, there are a thousand and one questions that I, I want to ask the follow on, but I'm going to respect your time and, and, and thank you so much for... Thank you for having me. This has been such a blessing. Um, I'm honored that you selected me to be on your show. 